Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. So again, my name is Jim Parisi. I'm a field rep with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm the new president of the Rhode Island Labor History Society. Thank you for coming out on a rainy night. We're not done eating and drinking yet. They're going to bring out some coffee and pastry, but it's uh, close to 7.30, so I thought it was important for us to get moving um, with the program. Uh, I've got a few introductory remarks, and then we'll move on to the speakers. Um, First of all, I stand here on behalf of uh, a number of different uh, dedicated volunteers who run the Labor History Society. The organization has existed for about 27 years now. Um, our founder, Scott Malloy, was happy to finally um, uh, pass on the reins of leadership. So Scott, Kathy Collette, our most recent past president, uh, I, want, I want everyone to know who you two are. Uh, you founded this organization. Thank you for allowing us to celebrate uh, labor history. Linda LeClaire is our uh, Vice President of the Labor History Society, made all the food arrangements. Hey! Uh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Matt D. Tommaso is our treasurer. He's going to pay the bill for your dinner. <laughs> and Mike D'Amico is our, is our uh, secretary, who all, is also the logistics man, who, who set up the, the different uh, signs on the perimeter, set up our print spaghetti uh, receptacles for donated food, and just about everything else under the sun. Mike D'Amico. So the Labor History Society is dedicated to keeping labor history alive. Uh, we're very proud to have an organization that has about 450 members on our list in a small state like the state of Rhode Island. We do a number of different things during the year. Uh, probably our biggest annual event is our August uh, celebration when we induct people and, and honor uh, three or four different people into, uh, into the Labor, Heritage, uh, labor uh, History Society. Hall of Fame. We do that at the Roger Williams Park Casino. It's, a, it's an important event where we get to recognize labor leaders from different um, uh, labor organizations as well as community members. We are dedicated to running programs like this where we try and have uh, interesting topics that we could talk to people about and, and people can, uh, can learn something about labor history. Uh, one really neat and interesting thing we do is um, students in, in public and private um, sc high schools in Rhode Island and some middle schools uh, participate in uh, Labor Day, uh, I mean uh, History Day, a national uh, com competition f uh, where students do either uh, a paper or a, or a PowerPoint or a different kind of history project. We cut $100 checks to all students who do projects oriented towards labor to encourage uh, labor studies amongst our students. We publish lots of pamphlets and booklets. And if you didn't grab them when they came in, we have a freebie. Um, we, you know, we have uh, something that I, we'd love to have you all take home with you if you haven't uh, done it already. It's uh, Marxist militants and macaroni. There's interesting pictures and a story about what we're going to hear about tonight. We've also reproduced uh, a, a paper from our, our, our keynote speaker today. But we do a lot of publications, again, to keep labor history alive in a real important way. We are a cost-effective organization. We have not cheap dues, but affordable dues. And if you're not a member of the Labor History Society, membership applications are over there. Uh, thank you for the seven people who've already handed in their dues this evening. Uh, thank you and welcome to our organization. Coming up, uh, we have one event coming up next month. Uh, again, in an effort to keep labor history alive and remind people about the struggles uh, that got us to where we are today. Uh, this, pat this month is the 40th anniversary of the death of an AFSCME member who was killed on a picket line over at M IMH uh, in Cranston. So 
because we had this going on now, we're uh, having a 40 year and one month commemoration of the death of Wilma Schessler. We're going to have it over at IMH in Cranston on December 9th. That's the kind of thing we do to remind everyone in Rhode Island about uh, struggles that have gone on in the past. And uh, in addition to the pamphlets, uh, just one other reminder, uh, well, two other reminders. Number one, we also have posters. If you, had, if you didn't take a poster coming in, take one going out. Uh, because every single book and pamphlet and poster that we don't give out tonight, Scott has to put in his basement. And uh, <laughs> he's had enough of that. Uh, and then the final reminder is something I, I spoke about a half hour ago. We're not charging uh, for the dinner. Uh, many people donated food that we're going to give to the food pantry uh, located at this parish. Uh, and if you're so inclined and you want to make a cash contribution to the Rhode Island Food Bank, we're going to be making a donation on behalf of all the members of the Labor History Society. You can give a check to myself or my, uh, my uh, bride who's sitting in the back corner over there with the envelope full of the many donations that have already been given. Uh, thank you all very much for that. We have one, um, one change in program notes. Unfortunately, one of our two speakers, uh, Dr. Eve Stern, is not, is not available to, uh, to join us this evening. She had a, a family medical situation that needed uh, attending to, and it's a real disappointment that uh, she's not going to be able to, uh, to come and speak. She, she wrote a really interesting book uh, related to um, the Catholic Church and, and, and its relationship with um, with a labor movement that uh, really speaks to uh, what we're going to talk about this evening, uh, but perhaps at some other time we'll, uh, you all will have an opportunity here to hear from her directly. But we have a, uh, we have a keynote speaker, uh, Russell D. Simone, whom I've never heard before, but he comes highly recommended and, and uh, he is highly recommended by important people. And uh, he's, gonna, he's going to um, give us a talk. I, uh, Russell is an expert in the Door uh, War and, and Thomas Door, uh, which is the in, r really interesting Rhode Island uh, story. He's uh, what I'd call an amateur historian. He's been doing it on his own for uh, close to 30 years now. He's published articles. He's, uh, you know, he's published books related to Thomas Door. Uh, but he also was going to bring some expertise on something that happened in this neighborhood uh, 100 years ago uh, related to uh, uh, food riots. And when people were uh, asking me, well, why is the Labor History Society doing something related to a food riot that happened on Federal Hill um, 100 years ago, um, number one, I'm hoping Russ informs us of that. But I'll, I'll let the, all of you know what, what I believe, having read through it. Uh, a lot of people who were involved in the labor movement in this neighborhood 100 years ago were also involved in the food protests and the food riots themselves. Uh, to the point where uh, there was a Labor Day celebration shortly after the riots and the people in this community who were somewhat unhappy with what was going on with the AFL at the time hosted their own Labor Day celebration in Oneyville. Uh, a week or so after the official Labor Day celebration. So there's definitely a labor angle to this story. And without further ado, Russ DeSimo. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here on such an inclement evening. Uh, initially, I was going to speak for 20 minutes, and then Eve Stern was going to get up, and I figured, well, she can carry the load, she's the PhD, and I would just give you an overview of what was happening here on Federal Hill and something about the macaroni riots. Now, it's most appropriate for me that this meeting is being held here at the Holy Ghost Church. Okay? Uh, it was nearly 80 years ago that my parents were married here. It was also the place where my grandparents were buried from. And probably, most notoriously, it was from here that I made my first communion and my confirmation. So I'm always pleased to be here at the Holy Ghost Church. It's the most important church to me in the state. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the macaroni riots, give you a little flavor as to what came down, what transpired. Uh, most importantly, Joe Sullivan's book is a detailed account I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor, but if you go through Joe's book, you're going to get a real fine understanding. So with that, 
I'm not sure if we'll be able to see these slides in the back, so I'll kind of read them if you don't mind. Uh, this is about the Providence Italian community. And before Federal Hill was Italian, it was Irish. And I've been asked to make a statement by <laughs> Ray McKenna, who's right there. Raise your hand, Ray. Uh, Ray has a blog, and it's called Federal Hill Irish. And anybody that has any information pertaining to the Irish on Federal Hill, please see Ray. He's got a wonderful blog. He updates it frequently. And there's nobody more passionate about being Irish and on Federal Hill than Ray. And he lives in Connecticut. <laughs> I'm in exile. I'm in exile. <laughs> anyway, uh, there was a small influx of Italians coming to Rhode Island in the 1860s, but it was very small. It wasn't until a little later that we begin to see northern Italians coming to Rhode Island. And they came from the northern provinces. You can read them, Piedmont, Lombardy, Tuscany, Liguria. And I have a couple of little side notes I want to make about northern Italians, OK? When I was a boy, my father came from Silver Lake. My mother came here from Federal Hill. We lived on Federal Hill. I'm from Federal Hill. But we always went to Silver Lake to get a haircut. My, my father and I get in the car, and we drive to Silver Lake, his turf, and we get a haircut. And one night, well, one day, uh, there was somebody in a barber chair. He's getting a haircut. And he's speaking a language which I didn't understand. It wasn't English, which I sometimes people say I don't understand. And it wasn't really Italian, I didn't think. So on the way home, I asked my father in the car, what was that man speaking? He said, well, it's a dialect of Italian, but he's northern Italian. And he said, never trust northern Italians. <laughs> OK? That's a fact. And I've come to find that out for myself. OK? But at the turn of the century, people from the south came, from Abruzzi, okay? uh, from Campania, where my father's father came from from Balasica and from Calabria, where my mother's folks are from. I had an uncle, and his name was Francesco, but everybody buddy, called him Cal. And the reason they called him Cal, it was short for Calabrese. Okay? Um, so we see people settling in Federal Hill, in Silver Lake, which is a brand new development, and in the north end, Charles Street, uh, right around uh, Hopkins Park the Wassanian Church, a lovely church, okay? The year of the riots in Providence, there's an estimated 20,000 Italians. It's a significant increase, and the only thing I can liken it to is if you look at the Hispanic influx and the uh, population growth, it's similar to that. It's a century later, but it's similar. I want to uh, mention what a few people have said, because when Italians came here, we brought certain things. It just wasn't, you know, good pasta. There was other things that we brought, OK? <laughs> At the outset of mass migration, radicalism was an emergent characteristic of the political scene in many European countries, especially Eastern European countries. Uh, in the case of Italians, a small but committed group of radicals became immigrants to the United States, some permanently and others for a temporary stay. And this is uh, Salvatore Lagume's uh, introduction to um, the American Italian Historical Society uh, report. They do these great reports once a year. You can get your hands on them. It's, it's wonderful reading. In this particular one, the uh, topic was uh, Italian radicalism. And in the same uh, study, uh, Nunzio Perricone said, probably the first militants to reach these shores were refugees from the government repression that destroyed the first international in Italy around the end of the 1870s. Thereafter, persecution and poverty, very important, persecution and poverty play an important role in these riots, accounted for a steady diaspora of Italian anarchists, hundreds of whom were eventually swept along with the wave of immigrants to North and South America. Certainly by the 1890s, an Italian anarchist colony was well, well established on American soil. 
I'm not saying everybody that was Italian living on Federal Hill was an anarchist. I don't want to read about that in that blog, right? Okay? <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is, that kind of thinking, and we're going to see it all the way up to Sacco and Vanzetti case in the 1920s, but anarchists were coming over. Anarchists were responsible for killing President McKinley. Okay? Uh, it's just the way the world was going. But then I had a quote for Eve. This was going to be a surprise for her, but she's not here. I was going to quote from Bibles and Ballots. Ethnics disconnected from electoral politics by language, citizenship, and inexperience, and, uh, as well as voting restrictions. Okay? They're new to the country. They don't fit in, and things are not going to go easily. And this is true today of any immigrant as it was 100 years ago. Although focused on food prices, the riots reflect larger resentments over poverty, political impotence, and the difficulty of preserving old ways in a new country. Okay. There's a lot of resentment, and you're going to see the shift in the riots go from the merchants to the Anglo-Irish police force. And you're going to see that on the second night of riots. Okay. A couple of more quotes. Paul Brule, uh, in the uh, Italian-American radicals in, in labor in Rhode Island, continuing unemployment, skyrocketing prices, and the specter of a European war from which American profiteers were amassing fortunes, deepened Italian resentment, Italian-American resentment in 1914 and provided radicals with an unprecedented legitimacy. Okay? So what you're going to see is these people who just being sucked dry by the merchants and profiteering predicated on the World War. But they're upset for other reasons as well. They're not treated well by the uh, establishment. Let's put it that way. There were two investigations when prices went up. One was a statewide investigation. One was a citywide investigation. In the statewide investigation, upon the order of Governor Abram Pottier, State Commissioner of Industrial Statistics, George Webb, investigates causes for increases in food prices. And it wasn't just pasta. Prices were going up on cheese, on olive oil, you name it. Report submitted on April 19th concludes price increases are due to outside causes. Surprise. The government told it's not us. Somebody else, okay? The next day, Mayor Gaynor from Providence, I'm going to have to take a break now, dessert here. <laughs> In a separate investigation called by Providence Mayor Joseph Gaynor and conducted by Rhode Island Retail Grocers and Marketmen Association, why would you have them doing the study? Okay? Draws a similar conclusion in a report on August 20th. So on the 19th, Republican Governor Pottier says, oh, not us. And the next day, Democratic Mayor Gaynor draws the same conclusion, but he's got you know, the foxes doing the study. Kind of a ludicrous. So I'm going to try and tell the story of this riot through a series of a newspaper headlines, because I thought that's the best way in a short amount of time to see it. So I got a lot of slides, and I'm going to try and read them so the people in the back can also get a flavor. This is uh, Governor Poitier, and as you can see, uh, outsiders responsible for increases here. Couldn't be, couldn't be uh, our local merchant. <laughs> They're as pure as the driven snow. Okay. I went the wrong way on that. And here is uh, Mayor Gaynor. I think I took this off your website, Paul Campbell. He's not hearing me, so that's good. I think I took this picture off your website. Oh, this is uh, the, uh, the mayor. Big headlines, local food merchants deny responsibility. Well, who the heck is rising these prices then? If it isn't our local merchants, is it somebody overseas? You've got to remember that the war just broke out, World War I. But it's only a, a week or two old. 
it's impossible for food to become so scarce in Europe that it can't be shipped here. So what's causing this? It's, it's profiteering. And the best part is The Labor Advocate, great radical newspaper edited by Robert Hunt. <clears throat> and now it's August 22nd. It's the Saturday following these midweek reports. And I, I don't think you can see it, uh, but intense suffering caused by rise in price of food. Workers starve while investigations, investigators talk. Folly to expect any benefit from investigation conducted by officials of Gainer or Pottier type. Okay, so the labor newspaper, the labor advocate, is calling the shots fairly accurately. Okay, people are starving. What's happened is, the previous year, 1913, there's an economic downturn. People are either unemployed, or if they are working, they've had their wages cut. 20%. They're working at places like the Queen Dye down the street or at Brown and Sharp up the road. Okay? They're finding they have to do with less. And of course, they have fairly good sized families back then. And the staple that you put on an Italian table, as you found out tonight, is three different kinds of pasta. <laughs> the following Sunday, the 22nd, I, I should point out there's several protest meetings. The first takes place on a Saturday evening. It takes place on Dean Street and Atwells Avenue, right in front of where the Karl Marx Club was. Okay? Uh, it's also where my mother lived. She lived on Barker Street. Okay? <laughs> well, I don't want to say my mother was a radical, but uh, she was alive at the time. But uh, it takes place there. And these people, they're not anarchists, they're socialists. They're making trouble. And they call for a mass meeting. And 2,000 people show up, okay? Significant number of people. The week before, they plastered all of these placards, uh, little handbills, saying there's going to be a meeting. And numerous people get up. And they basically deride the merchant for being profiteers. And there's a large police force on hand that evening, okay? There's um, a significant number of police on standby. And they're listening. Many of the speakers are speaking in English. And they can tell if something's going to happen. And nothing happens. Everybody speaks. Everybody goes away, okay? But you got a lot of people uh, there. That's uh, 23rd. Uh, mayor the next day says, still not his responsibility. He says, it's coming from outside the area. It's not our local merchants. The biggest local merchant on the uh, avenue was Frank Ventrone. Okay? He is a cross. I'll try and explain it for most people. Uh, he's next to like, a, you know where the $3 bar is? <laughs> yeah, they're right there. Uh, where the Siena restaurant is. Right in that block, for you, Scott, it's across from Shallow Brothers and, and Cream Puffs, okay? <laughs> but it's right there. And he owns a, a, a block and a half. Not only does he have his import business there, but there's also a pharmacy, which he owns. There is a dry goods store, which is a Jewish merchant owns. Uh, and there is a, a, a barber shop, okay? All belonging to Mr. Ventrone. The labor advocate on the 29th, and keep in mind, the labor advocate gets published on Saturday morning. So they're saying, well, Italian workers of Federal Hill have big protest meetings. He's talking about the one the Saturday before. He doesn't know that this evening, the 29th of August, there's going to be real problems in Federal Hill. There's going to be a massive riot, and the target for all of this is going to be the buildings of Frank Ventron. And of course, it says local men are not to blame for high prices. You just hear it over and over. Okay? And powers that be, it's not sinking in that you can't keep giving that answer 
to this population during this time. I often thought that if all of these studies were done in July, I mean in January, there probably would have been no riots. You ever notice that riots happen in the hot days of summer? <laughs> Ferguson, Missouri is a good example of that. It was in August. The riots in Providence, they're in August. And the reason is, it's too damn hot in the flats that people are living in. So they go out to the streets. They go out to cool off. Okay? So you have lots of people in a small area milling about. You get some rabble-rousing speakers going, and it's pretty easy there's going to be a problem. Okay? I wanted to quote Joe Sullivan from his book, uh, page 82. Okay? And this is right on. Rioting is an electoral activity of the disenfranchised. If I can't vote and change what's happening, well, I got another way of getting your attention. And, and it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be a riot. Okay. Keep in mind, that's the best quote for the whole thing, Joe Sullivan. Well, what happened that night is Providence Police did not staff as many people as they normally would have because the previous Saturday, things were pretty quiet. 2,000 people show up, there's no riot, everybody goes home. Well, this Saturday, only 1,000 people show up. That's probably the inhabitants of one block. You know? But 1,000 people show up, and they are whipped into a frenzy. Okay? And there's one person in particular that seems to be the, the ringleader for this, Emmanuel Parati. Okay? He eventually is going to get a jail sentence and a fine. But he's the ringleader for breaking the windows of Ventrone's shop. Just the windows alone cost Frank Ventrone $2,000. All of his uh, wares, all of the pasta, all of the olive oil, all of the cheeses, are all on Atwell's Avenue, all being trampled by people. And I'm going to tell you a little anecdote. My mother, as I said, lived on Baca Street. And she always referred to her childhood friend as Mary Pataco. Now, this woman grows up. She gets married. She has a married name. My mother still called her by her childhood name. Well, just before Joe Sullivan wrote the book that came out in 2000, I had researched the macaroni riots. And I see this name, Pataco. Frank Pataco shot in the ankle on Saturday evening. So I contact my mother. And I said, do you know a Frank Pataco that lived on Baca Street? Same street. And if you go down Baca Street, you know, it's, it's like from here to the wall. There's only a few houses. And she said, well, I don't know, but I'm going to call up Mary Pataco. I never knew that woman's <laughs> married name. <laughs> so she calls up, and sure enough, it was her uncle. So when I talked to Scott at the time, he said, oh, Joe Sullivan's writing a book. So we worked it where Joe could talk to Mary Pataco, who was at that time close to 90 years old. And at the height of this riot, she and her father are in Bakeman's Shoe Store, which is across the street from Ventrone's shop. And she is hidden with her sister in the back room until the riots blow over. So 100 years later, uh, and we still have some anecdotal you know, first-hand accounts. Now, Mary Pataco's gone, my mother's gone, but th just the fact that you could reach back nearly 100 years and still touch history, that's why you have to ask questions, just like you've done and like Ray's doing. Ask those questions, because that's where history will come from. But on the Sunday morning, they come up with this Federal Hill mob wrecks four stores, all of the Ventrone stores. No one else's stores are wrecked. Miraculous. You know, <laughs> as they're out to get Frank Ventrone. He is a wholesaler of Italian goods. All right? But he's not the only one that's driving up prices. Others are. And little does this uh, Providence Sunday Journal know that the mother of all riots is going to break out that evening. The biggest riot is on Sunday evening, August the 30th. The Sunday Tribune, we're blessed that Providence had a number of newspapers at the time, so you can get 
different angles on things. The Tribune says several hurt in riot on Federal Hill. And the following day, after the Sunday riot, the Evening Tribune battled with bullets and stones on Federal Hill. Well, what happened is, Sunday afternoon, people are about, a fellow that was commonly called the chicken, his name is Al Carroll, so I think he might be Irish. Okay? <laughs> Al Carroll is kind of separated from his wife. And his wife is going to serve papers on him, okay? And these papers are going to be served by a policeman. Now, it's the Sunday afternoon of the night following the riot. And Patrolman Brown, Constable Brown, gets introduced to the chicken by the chicken's estranged wife. He thinks it's a boyfriend of hers. And as he puts out his hand, because he's probably glad to be rid of her, you know, put it there, buddy. He gets slapped with handcuffs. Well, everybody in the neighborhood thinks that they're arresting the chicken because he was involved in the riots the night before. And all hell breaks loose. For the next four hours, there is rioting up and down Atwell's Avenue, just not at Frank Ventrone's, all the way up to uh, Dean Street and all the way down here to Knight Street. The police fire into the crowds. The crowds fire back. Okay. It, it's a horrible, horrible story. Uh, the police had to be called in. Several hundred police have to show up. They had telephones in those days, and they would call in for reinforcements. And uh, two of the people that were injured on the law and order side was a patrolman, Frank Walters. He gets into kind of a fight. He's being overpowered by some you know, uh, Italians, let's say. And someone sticks a, a knife into his ear, and he's bleeding profusely. He somehow gets to his feet, and he makes it to the fire station. Uh, and the fire station, if anybody who doesn't remember Federal Hill, is where the parking lot is for the Roma restaurant today. But that was the, the horse barn at the time, you know. Um, I think it was a, a hose company, OK? Uh, so he goes in there looking for a sanctuary. They kind of scurry him off. Well, eventually the people chasing him figure out he's in the fire uh, station, and they fire through the door. And patrolman, a lieutenant, Robert McDonald, takes a bullet in the face. Now, there were over 40 people wounded. One, very seriously, a young 15-year-old boy is shot in the chest, and he's expected to die. Okay. But in reality, no one dies. In all of the rioting that's going to take place on Federal Hill, nobody is going to be killed. There's going to be a lot of sore people, people with bullet wounds in the shoulder, with bullet wounds in the leg. Uh, most of the um, rioters are not going to go to Rhode Island Hospital and seek attention because they're going to get arrested. So they go to local doctors. Uh, and it's estimated this is about 40 people but it's almost uh, incongruous to believe that police would shoot into a crowd, and the crowd would fire back. And I find it you know, there's something about the marksmanship of these policemen, but nobody <laughs> dies. <laughs> you know, the Door Rebellion, which was considered a tempest in a teapot by many, at least we had two people die. You know, so this is a riot kind of low scale for, the, for, for that kind of thing. But a lot of people are injured, OK? Um, and what you're seeing is the frustration of the people, OK? It starts off as we're angry with Frank Ventrone, so we're going to trash his building. And by the second night, no one cares about Frank Ventrone. This is a battle between the Italian colony of Federal Hill and the police force of Anglos and Irish, OK? And it's really unfortunate. But for so many years, they have been uh, put down, and they're uh, resentful. And I think that you, know, you, you can't stress that enough. They're facing you know, great poverty, unemployment. Their families are going hungry. 
and now the police are turning on them, and they can't understand, nor can Joe Sullivan in his book, he's really strong about that, nor can Joe understand why do they not take it out on the established people, the merchants that are ripping off the working class people. This is a class issue. Okay? This isn't Italians or anarchists or socialists. This is a class issue of people being oppressed. And that's very important to understand, except in this particular case, in this particular month of August, this Italian community is not going to stand for it. I still think if it was January, things might have gone differently. Oh, it's cold out there, you've got to put a coat on. I'm not going to go protest, okay? 18 hurt in riot on Federal Hill. That's the Providence Journal the day after. The evening news, riots on Federal Hill results in one fatality uh, and 17 hurt. Well, the fatality turns out not to be a fatality. Okay, it's this young 15-year-old boy. Uh, it's unfortunate, but he does ultimately uh, get better. But he took a bullet in the chest and frankly, I don't know how good the uh, doctors were at that time, but it's quite remarkable that you would uh, survive something like that. This is Frank Ventrone. He's only going to live until uh, a year or two later. He dies at 55 years old. And this is, uh, I know you can't see it in the back, but this is his billhead. Uh, and it says, uh, wholesaler. Italian importer. If you go back a few years, he was also importing French food on his billheads. I guess there wasn't enough of a demand. He wasn't in one socket or West Warwick. Okay, so you know, he changes his billhead. But this is Frank, and and these are three scenes I'm going to show you in the newspapers. They look a whole lot better in Joe Sullivan's book. But uh, the Evening Tribune uh, had a great shot. This is one in the bulletin, the uh, evening bulletin. And this is, uh, again, the evening bulletin. And this is on Monday, OK? The riot took place on Sunday. It took place on Saturday evening before. But on Monday, they're able to process these prints. And something happens on that Monday that's really important. There's a conference between Frank Ventrone's representatives, his son-in-law, A.E. Ventrone, who was also an importer, his son-in-law, who was German, not even Italian, I find that kind of remarkable, and one other representative. And who do they meet with? They don't meet with Mayor Gaynor. That would be a waste of time. They don't meet with Governor Pacquiao. That would be a waste of time. They meet with the socialists at the Karl Marx Club. And how do they do that? Well. There's policemen that are cordoned off the Karl Marx Club. The police are not stupid. They know where the problems are coming from. They're coming out of the activists at the Karl Marx Club. So they put a, a police uh, guard around it. So you have to get rid of the police. So they issue a statement that there's going to be a big protest meeting in Silver Lake. <laughs> and they take all of the police and they run them up to Silver Lake including mounted police, okay? There's a, a number of mounted police. And as soon as they're there, they meet in secret. And they strike a deal. Frank Ventrone, who's a wholesaler, will sell at wholesale prices to the people. So he's going to bypass the retail agents and sell directly to the people. And he's also going to cut the prices. So he's already suffered great loss, but Frank Ventrone is just one merchant. And if you live elsewhere, if you live on Child Street, what good does that do you? Are you going to come to Atwell's Avenue to buy your pasta? Well, probably not. Okay? You need more merchants to get involved. And that's going to happen, but it's going to take a little more pressure. The, the reality is that the socialist movement made a difference in the price of food in 1914, okay? It was a success story. We have the evening news on September 1 saying 
Federal Hill War of food stuff prices is far from an end. Some, some people don't buy it. They know that Frank Finch owns but one dealer. And then you have the Evening Tribune coming out and the way Ventrone and the Socialists got together, it was the reporter for the Tribune. So he kind of scoops the Providence Journal, which I find uh, rather intriguing. And he's the man who broke the deal. Okay? So the Tribune says, oh, trouble in the Italian section is settled. Well, isn't that nice? But there's one more riot still to come. Okay? Ultimately, there's three riots. On the second, you got retailers on Federal Hill may organize and act on prices. So the other retailers, just not Frank Fenchon now, is saying, we're going to do something about this. They're losing business. People aren't buying. They're too busy throwing stones. And they're throwing things like paving stones, the cobblestones. And if you remember when you were a kid, uh, in the window there were these lead sashes. They're lobbing these <laughs> off the roofs. And you know you get hit by one of them, and it's kind of indiscriminate as to who it's going to hit, but it's going to kind of knock you out. There are a lot of injuries during the Sunday riot. In any event, our friends at the Labor Advocate, you got to love these people. Men and boys shot down in food price war. Many wounded by police bullets on Federal Hill. You know, that all the other newspapers give you one slant. The Labor Advocate. And you know, you gotta, you gotta take it with a grain of salt too, uh, as to what they had to say. But uh, I think they called the shots pretty nicely. Either that or I'm a radical. <laughs> One or the other. Uh, in any event, another Federal Hill riot is quickly suppressed. What happened is, this is September 8th. What happened on September 7th? September 7th is Labor Day in Rhode Island. It's a Monday, this is a Tuesday newspaper, and there is a call for all of uh, the socialists to come, this is what Jim was referring to, to come to Onlyville. Now, Onlyville is a, a, an interesting community. It's not an Italian community per se. There's a good number of Irish, there's a French, a, a French Canadian, uh, there's Polish there. You've got a nice blend of nationalities. And they're going to be holding their own uh, protest rally. And they're doing this in defiance of the AFL, which is having a grand parade for the hoi polloi of the uh, labor movement, you know, those that are not really uh, the ditch diggers of the world. So in Onlyville, you get a number of people getting up to speak. And they speak in this polygot of, of ways. People are speaking in Polish, and someone gets up and speaks in Italian. And when it's over, they all go in separate ways. The Italians march up Broadway, down Ridge Street. They come down here tonight and up Atwell's Avenue. And along the way, they are goaded on to causing another riot. And this riot is indiscriminate. It isn't uh, Frank Ventron. It's not the police. It's everybody. Private homes, any type of business. And you, you, you'll read sometimes it was just uh, a bunch of young hooligans. That's one of the terms used in the newspaper. But as Joe Sullivan uh, proved, I think definitively, if you look at the, uh, the people that were arrested in their ages, these are not children. These are men in their 40s and in their 50s. And they start just tearing up Atwell's Avenue. Now the police, I think they learned some lessons. You've got to give them credit. I think it was managed well. They don't fire, but they have 23 mounted patrolmen. And I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I'm not a farm boy. When I see a horse, <laughs> yeah, I once came out of PPAC with my wife. And that horse was so big, and the patrolman was very nice, but I just wanted to get in my car and get away. It was a <laughs> wild animal. And 23 of them march together down Atwell's Avenue, and you get all of these Italians going down to the various alleys, and behind them come the police force, and this time they're not firing into the crowd. They got their nightsticks, and a number of people are arrested. Um, so when all is said and done, 
in a nutshell, 23 people get arrested. Two of them uh, kind of uh, stand out. I'll give you a little background on them if I can find my notes here. And, the, and, and these two are fairly young. Uh, Emilio Giarusso, he's 17 year old, and he's got a concealed gun. Okay? And his compatriot, Antonio Gallo, 20 years old, is carrying a concealed razor. Okay. Now you have the store owners organizing for protection. You know, they're worried that there's going to be another riot. And for the next several weeks, Providence's uh, Federal Hill section is a large contingency of patrolmen. But effectively, the macaroni riots are over. So you have three nights of rioting, two in August, one uh, on a Saturday, and then the following day on Sunday, the major riot and then on Labor Day, another riot. Uh, all those people that are arrested are going to go to court. And uh, when the, they were carried off to court, Federal Hill was lined with 1,000 participants watching them being carried off to the courthouse. Okay. Um, in the case of uh, Gia Russo, he got three months and a $50 fine. And a $50 fine back then was a significant amount of money. Not that he would pay it. I'm sure our friends at the uh, Karl Marx Club would uh, float, float the money for that. Antonio Gallo, he just got a $35 fine. Pretty much everyone else was uh, uh, arrested as revelers, and they paid $20 fines. And uh, the big ringleader on the uh, uh, Sunday night uh, riot, well, that's Emilio Parati, Emmanuel Parati. Uh, he was fined $50 and a prison term of six months, which was significant, okay? Uh, but basically, at that time, uh, the battles are done. Uh, there was an attempt, uh, this is on the jail terms, there was an, whoops, whoa, I don't know what happened there. See if I can, uh, I just got a couple of other slides, I, I won't try and keep you too long here. The trouble is you give me one of these clickers and we're all in for trouble. Uh, Italian workers to seek redress on election day. We don't vote. Remember what the, <laughs> remember what Joe Sullivan did, said, okay? Rioting is what we have to resort to. That's our electoral uh, alternative. But we don't vote, at least not yet. Okay. Uh, the following week, there was an attempt to hold another protest rally uh, up at Hopkins Park uh, on Child Street. And the speakers got there, people got there, but not all the speakers thought it was wise to speak. There was too many police in attendance, so they canceled and that was the end of the riots. I, I just want to talk about the aftermath of the riots. When all is said and done, the way the Italian community would prosper was not by rioting, okay? True education and running for office. And that's what uh, Eve was going to talk to you about uh, on that side. But this is the very first graduating class of Providence College, 1923. And you can't see it, because uh, it's a horrible projector that we got, frankly. They're all Irish. Scott, you'd love it. They're all Irish, except <laughs> right over here, this little guy. He's about half the size of everyone else. And that's Victor Perry. That's my great uncle. He's in the first graduating class of Providence College, and he goes on to become a pharmacist. Okay. He was born in this country, but he was conceived in Italy. So part of the success story, you get ahead through uh, education. And I, I couldn't pass up a chance to show some of my political ephemera with Italians on it. So here you have Louis Capelli, the uh, first Italian to be elected to statewide office. 
And here you got uh, Thomas Paolino. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. I had to show some balance there. But uh, this is the 1930s. Times have changed. The uh, macaroni riots are 20 years old. Okay? The Italian community is being assimilated into this American experiment, this dream. Okay? And they're running for office, and sort of like uh, Abram Patia, they, they, you know, he becomes governor uh, at the time of the riots and a little bit earlier. They needed to have a, uh, a French Canadian on the ticket. You know, they're looking, the people that are figuring all of this out, how do you win, how do you defeat the Democrats, or how do you defeat the Republicans, and you get to draw that ethnic vote, and that's the way you, you do it. So these two gentlemen are the recipients of that kind of uh, positioning. And here we have John O. Pastore. He becomes governor in 1945 when J. Howard McGrath is uh, appointed a United States Attorney General. And his uh, state house, uh, this was such a humble man who came from Federal Hill. He lived in a two-decker house, okay? So the office that he ran out of until he moved in to the state house was in Silver Lake on a second floor flat. This is probably one of the most sincere uh, people we've ever had in political office, and integrity uh, to great degree. And now I just want to read a conclusion. On that Labor Day protest meeting in Oneyville, Robert Hunt, the editor of the Labor Advocate and a great radical, he has this to say. What has the battle of Federal Hill and the events which preceded it taught us working men and working women of Providence? The uprising of our Italian brothers has taught us one thing. It has taught us that the necessity of united action, the value of standing together, shoulder to shoulder, in opposition to those who would rob and cheat and defraud us. And that's the message of unionism. He understood it well, and that's what we saw transpire. We saw an Italian community coming together not as local, you know, such and such, but standing together shoulder to shoulder in protest because of their frustration of the conditions in which they were living. And while it was initially focused on Frank Ventrone, it quickly shifted to the police department. And frankly, you know, those Irish policemen were not in much better position. These are working guys. You know, they're putting their life on the line. They're being shot at stabbed, and they're just trying to find their piece of the American dream. And that's what this is all about. And that's all I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to read Joe Sullivan's book, or you can read my essay, which was uh, published in uh, the Italian America Journal, uh, which is part of the University of Rhode Island, I might add. Um, and you can get the, the specifics, you know, names and ages and uh, almost a blow-by-blow -blow account. Joe did a very credible job there. Anyway, that's all I have. I'm willing to take questions, if that's okay. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.